Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike. You guys are rocking with me and Mike's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we're diving back into our World War One uh, series with 1915. And as always, we're just going to get right into it. So let's go. January 1915. World War One is just five months old, and already around one million soldiers have fallen. A war that began in the Balkans has engulfed much of the world. The central powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, fight the Allies. Britain, France, Russia, Serbia and Montenegro, Belgium and Japan. In Poland and the Baltic, the Russian army has suffered a string of massive defeats but continues to battle German and Austro-Hungarian forces. Yeah, they literally lost an entire freaking army out there at the hands of Hindenburg and Ludendorff, you know what I'm saying? They both, but obviously that was back in 2014, or 19, 2014. That was back in 1914, so you know what I'm saying? But yeah, they just had like an entire army just decimated, you know what I'm saying? That's ridiculous. Feats, but continues to battle German and Austro-Hungarian forces. Austro-Hungarian troops have also suffered huge losses and are humiliated by their failure to defeat Serbia. In the Caucasus Mountains, Russian and Ottoman forces fight each other in freezing winter conditions. While on the Western Front, French, British and Belgian troops are dug in facing the Germans, in trenches stretching from the English Channel to Switzerland. It's kind of crazy how, you know what I'm saying, it, when you really look at it in a big picture, there's a lot of crap going on, there's a lot of death, and it's so crazy to think about because, like, not even 20, 30 years ago, when we were looking at death tolls and 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 um, war and stuff like that, we are only seeing, like, 60,000, 70,000, something like, that's like, you know what I'm saying, that's like on the high end, but now we're already at a million, we're only a year in, like, that's ridiculous. As part of the world's first strategic bombing campaign, Germany sends two giant airships known as Zeppelins to bomb Britain. They hit the ports of Kings Lynn and Great Yarmouth, damaging houses and killing four civilians. At sea, at the Battle of Dogger Bank, the British Navy sinks one German cruiser, but the rest of the German squadron escapes. Command of the seas has allowed Britain to impose a naval blockade of Germany, preventing vital supplies, including food, from reaching the country by sea. Germany now retaliates with its own blockade. I wonder if, um, cause I, like how you said, Britain had a huge naval blockade, you know, stopping them, which is a huge factor later on in the war. Is, you know, there's the, the starving populace and stuff like that. Do you guys think that before this war, war started off, do you guys think that Maybe if they would have set something up, uh, maybe between Norway or something, so that they can meet their ships at the very top, like, you know, at, you know, northern of Norway, and then have it, like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know, something. So that way they can still get their stuff in and not be as uh, affected as they uh, were, you know? Those people. Retaliates with its own blockade. It declares the waters around the British Isles to be a war zone where its U-boats will attack Allied merchant ships without warning. Britain relies on imported food to feed its population. Germany plans to starve her into surrender. On the Eastern Front, German Field Marshal von Hindenburg launches a winter offensive and inflicts another massive defeat on the Russian army at the Second Battle of Masurian Lakes. The Russians lose up to 200,000 men, half of them surrendering amid freezing winter conditions. Damn, could you guys imagine if, like, Napoleon had Hindenburg or, like, you know what I'm saying, one of those really top tier journals at you know, this time, like this, in his, con his Continental Army, you know, uh, whenever he invaded into Russia later on? Do you think, like, I feel like he probably still would have lost, but there would have been some real great battles in that, you know what I'm saying? 
Working amid freezing winter conditions. The Russians have more success against Austria-Hungary. The city of Chemischul falls after a four-month siege, netting the Russians 100,000 prisoners. Austria-Hungary's total losses now reach 2 million. And as, and as always, which is just crazy to me, Germany's allies have, like literally do nothing to help out the cause I mean, they help out a little bit, but not like, you know what I'm saying? Two million already. One year. We were only one year in, and they're already two million down. Like, that's... They're just throwing people at it. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's ridiculous. But they're still in it, apparently. That's... Austria-Hungary's total losses now reach two million. Meanwhile, the British and French send warships to the Dardanelles to threaten Constantinople, capital of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. They believe a show of force will quickly cause Turkey to surrender. They bombard Turkish shore forts in the narrow straits. But three battleships are sunk by mines and three more damaged. The attack is called off. On the Western Front, the British attack at Neuve Chapelle. But the advance is soon halted by German barbed wire and machine guns. British and Indian units suffer 11,000 casualties, about a quarter of the attacking force. And in my opinion, the Indian uh, force that was there deserves way more praise than they pr most likely got. Because, I mean, think about it. These dudes were forced to go thousands of thousands of miles to fight a foreign war that had nothing to really do with them. It had nothing to do with their land. It wasn't affecting their land or anything, you know what I'm saying? And they still went there, fought, and did it, you know what I'm saying? So, it's, I don't know. They definitely deserve a lot of praise, in my opinion. So. The attacking force. Six weeks later, at the Second Battle of Ypres, the Germans attack with poison gas for the first time on the Western Front. A cloud of lethal chlorine forces Allied troops to abandon their trenches. But the Germans don't have enough reserves ready to exploit the advantage. Soldiers on both sides are quickly supplied with crude gas masks as a chemical weapons arms race begins. I wonder what, um, I wonder what the Allied troops thought, you know, whenever they saw that big, thick, looming cloud, you know what I'm saying, coming their way. Just, you know what I'm saying, that, that probably, because at first I'm thinking they probably thought it was just mist or fog or something like that, and then they thought to themselves, no, that's really, really thick or something, you know what I'm saying? And it's just coming and coming and starts burning and, Next thing you know, your lungs are burning, your face is burning, your eyes, you know, everything's burning and clearing you out. But yeah, let's go and keep that going there. The weapons arms race begins. The Allies land ground troops at Gallipoli, including men of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, the Anzacs. Their goal is to take out the shore forts that are preventing Allied warships reaching Constantinople. But they immediately meet fierce Turkish resistance and are pinned down close to the shore. The day before the landings, the Ottoman Empire begins the systematic deportation and murder of ethnic Armenians living within its borders. The Armenians are a long persecuted ethnic and religious minority suspected of supporting Turkey's enemies. Tens of thousands of men, women and children are transported to the Syrian desert and left to die. In all, more than a million Armenians perish. The Allies condemn the events as a crime against humanity and civilization and promise to hold the perpetrators criminally responsible. To this day, the Turkish government disputes the death toll and that these events constituted a genocide. Yeah, I was about to say, because I, I think I saw something earlier this year about how um, the Turkish uh, president condemned how uh, Biden was, um, you know, acknowledged it on the day that it happened and all that. And he con he condemned it because he was like, you know, it, 
we don't see it happen or we, you know, dispute the, the, the stuff. And it's like, but it happened. You know what I'm saying? Like, the bodies are there. The bodies are still probably there. Bones don't really, you know what I'm saying, does go that quickly. It's not hard to prove. Like, you guys don't have to lie, you know what I'm saying? That these events constituted a genocide. On the Eastern Front, a joint German-Austro-Hungarian offensive in Galicia breaks through Russian defences, recapturing Chemischul and taking 100,000 prisoners. It is the beginning of a steady advance against Russian forces. At sea, the British passenger liner Lusitania, sailing from New York to Liverpool, is torpedoed by a German U-boat off the coast of Ireland without warning. 1,198 passengers and crew perish, including 128 Americans. US President Woodrow Wilson and the American public are outraged. But Germany insists the liner was a fair target as the British used her to carry military supplies. Honestly, I feel like uh, I feel like Germany did pre-warn everyone. Like these waters around here are off limits. Like we're trying to starve them out for a reason. You can't just be bringing stuff in willy-nilly. You know what I'm saying? Like they did pre-warn everybody. Just saying that you know these are off-limit waters around here. Unfortunately, but we're gonna. As the British used her to carry military supplies. In May, the Allies launched the Second Battle of Artois in another effort to break through the German lines. The French make the main attack at Vimy Ridge, while the British launch supporting attacks at Aubert Ridge and Festubert. The Allies sustain 130,000 casualties and advance just a few thousand yards. That summer, above the Western Front, the Fokker Eindecker helps Germany win control of the air. It's one of the first aircraft with a machine gun able to fire forward through its propeller, thanks to a new invention known as interrupter gear. Allied aircraft losses mount rapidly in what becomes known as the Fokker Skirt. Now obviously they have those to counteract Allied planes that, they, we, that we had, but or, you know, that the Allied forces had and stuff like that. But I'm thinking, could the Allies could have, you know, sent those planes out in droves, essentially, the you know, although they're weaker, to go fight the Zeppelins and stuff like that so it wouldn't have caused so much damage or something like that. Mm. In what becomes known as the Fokker Scourge. Italy swayed by British and French promises of territorial gains at Austria-Hungary's expense, joins the Allies, declaring war on Austria-Hungary and later the Ottoman Empire and Germany. The Italian army makes its first assault against Austro-Hungarian positions along the Isonzo River, but is repulsed with heavy losses. Meanwhile, the Allies face a crisis on the Eastern Front. The Russians have begun a general retreat, abandoning Poland. German troops enter Warsaw on the 5th of August. Tsar Nicholas II dismisses the Russian army's commander-in-chief, Grand Duke Nicholas, and takes personal command. It will prove disastrous for the Tsar, as he becomes more and more closely tied to Russian military defeat. Plus, didn't the um, didn't his uh, Russian officers didn't they kind of take it as a slap in the face? Because it, it was pretty much like him saying, "Okay, obviously if I want something done right, I got to do it myself." Type of thing, and it's like, no, you just need to hire the right person. That's all. But closely tied to Russian military defeat at Gallipoli, the Allies land reinforcements at Suvla Bay. But neither they, nor a series of fresh attacks by the Anzacs, can break the deadlock. Conditions for both sides are terrible. Troops are tormented not only by the enemy, but by heat, flies, and sickness. And unfortunately, I think Gallipoli 
is like one of like one like one of only one or two or three different battles that the Ottoman Empire actually won. Like it, they didn't win. They didn't do that much. And that wasn't even a win. That was a deadlock. That was just a, a you know what I'm saying? It's just, I guess it's a win to them because they didn't have them invade in there. But still, you know what I'm saying? It was a deadlock. It wasn't even a win-win, you know? Flies and sickness. In the Atlantic, a German U-boat sinks the liner SS Arabic. 44 are lost, including three Americans. In response to further US warnings, Germany ends all attacks on passenger ships. On the Western Front, the Allies mount their biggest offensive of the war so far, designed to smash through the front and take pressure off their beleaguered Russian ally. The French attack in the Third Battle of Artois and Second Battle of Champagne. The British, with the help of poison gas, attack at loss. Despite initial gains, the attacks soon get bogged down with enormous losses on all sides. So, I mean, that's just, that's crazy looking at this, you know what I'm saying, looking at this, 147,000 uh, troops are casualties for Germany. That's like an entire war, you know what I'm saying, in most cases. So it's just crazy to see that happening just like, just like that. Allied troops land at Salonika in Greece to open a new front against the Central Powers and bring aid to Serbia. But the Allies are too late. Bulgaria joins the Central Powers. And their joint offensive overruns Serbia in two months. That winter, the remnants of the Serbian army escape through the Albanian mountains. Their losses are horrific. By the end of the war, a third of Serbia's army has been killed. The highest proportion of any nation. Yeah, and that's really crazy too. Um, if any of you guys are wondering why Bulgaria decided to obviously join the freaking, uh, the Axis powers, is mainly because, you know, they just had lost, um, the, I think it was the second or third Balkan war, if I'm not mistaken. Just let me know uh, which one in the comments, guys. But they just got finished losing that war, so they, and getting a little bit partitioned, you know what I'm saying? So they were looking to expand and get that, that land back, essentially, that, you know, they lost in those Balkan Wars, so. The highest proportion of any nation. Fierce fighting continues on the Italian front, as Italian troops launch the third and fourth battles of the Isonzo. Austro-Hungarian forces, though outnumbered, are dug in on the high ground, and impossible to dislodge. In the Middle East, a British advance on Baghdad is blocked by Turkish forces at the Battle of Tessifon, 25 miles south of the city. The British withdraw to Kut, where they are besieged. The Allies abandon the Gallipoli campaign. 83,000 troops are secretly evacuated without alerting Turkish forces. Not a man is lost. It's one of the best executed plans of the war. The campaign has cost both sides a quarter of a million casualties. It all happened on a, on a beach front that they couldn't even open up on. They lost 250, a quarter of a million, 250,000 for nothing, because they couldn't open it up anyway. It's just kind of sad, really. Lost a quarter of a lot. million casualties. 1915 is a bad year for the Allies. Enormous losses for no tangible gains. But there is no talk of peace. Instead, all sides prepare for even bigger offensives in 1916, with new tactics developed from earlier failures. All sides still believe a decisive battlefield victory is within grasp. All right, guys, we're going in right there. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff, right? Because it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you 
guys have already lost like millions and two million in Austro-Hungary, like at least a million in, uh, in probably like 1.3 million in freaking Germany, another million, you know what I'm saying, it's just, but they're still ready to keep going because they know that just one more battle and we probably could get it, and it's crazy to think about something like that, but hey, with that being said, thank you guys again for joining me on another episode of Mike's Intellectual Corner, I thank you guys again, please join me on another one, I'll see you guys when I see you, I'm out, peace!